Esplan Bart Ida, and he will speak on geoeconomics and consequences for the West. Thank you, Julian, and thanks for uh, having me here in a fascinating panel. I agree with very much of what has been said already. So I'll just uh, not repeat that, but say something else in the continuation. But I, I wanted first to uh, ask uh, a question. It's actually relatively easy, but uh, and, uh, you understand why. What exactly happened um, 28 years, two months, and 26 days ago? Who, yes, exactly. The yeah. Berlin Wall fell down. Wh why is that interesting? That's exactly it. So today is the day that the Berlin Wall has been down as long as it was up. So after midnight, it means there is, we've lived longer post, uh, post uh, Berlin Wall than we lived with the Berlin Wall. That's not insignificant because it puts some uh, time perspective on, uh, on this discussion. And I think I will start there by saying that when we look at what we refer to as Western institutions, whether they will survive or not, I think Western institutions as such uh, were at their best when we had the Berlin Wall. Because in many ways, the, the existence of a defined conflict, a defined adversary, a defined other, uh, created a sense of uh, common purpose, not only common threat, but also a common purpose, common project, uh, commonality of values, which shaped what the modern version of the West. I mean, the West has had other incarnations in in intellectual history, but the modern version of the West was very much shaped. And the um, second point is, America was at the core of that West for many, many years, since the end of the, I mean, in a sense, since, the, since during the Second World War and the, and the early institutions were actually formed while the war was still on. Um, and, and institutions that were made in the West came in several formats. They were those who became genuinely global, like the United Nations, that was actually a global institution and is a global institution. Then there were those that were nominally global, but in effect contained by the extended West, like the World Trade Organization at the time. And then you had the institutions that were even nominally Western, like NATO, uh, the uh, EEC, uh, the Council of Europe, for instance, which of course was European, but strongly supported again by the US. And we could say this, see that there was a sense that there was something, we had some shared challenges, but there was also a project that was bigger than ourselves. And seen, I think, in America, whether it was in the democratic version or a republican version, there was always a perception that we have our interests, but so many of them are shared with other countries like us, that there is something bigger than us. Now, the question, I think, which is the underpinning question, is that shared project still there? Is there enough of it? The answer is not yes or no because it's probably a, a touch of yes, yep. but is it enough of it to actually maintain a concept of a West that has its institutions and where Western, in quotation mark, countries put most of their emphasis on Western institutions or Western um, embodied institutions? When the, uh, so 28 years, two months and uh, 26 days ago, uh, uh, well, a few days later, because it took a couple of days to understand what had happened, we saw a phenomenal rise of globalization. The concept of globalization already existed, but what we actually meant was internationalization in that broad space, which of course was Europe and America, but also Japan, South Korea, Oceania, and so on, that, was, that shared some Western uh, facets, you know, the democracy, uh, market economy, and so on. And many of these institutions grew to become actually global. Uh, most importantly, the World Trade Organization, which had its heyday in the 90s, uh, and, and, and particularly since uh, 2001, when China joined the World Trade Organization and basically said, we, um, we accept the norms of that system. Interestingly, today, China, at least verbally, comes across as a stronger defender of uh, free trade based on rules than, for instance, the president of the US, who is rather critical of a free trade based order, at least nominally. I do agree, however, that um, theory is still worse than practice, that practice has not really caught up no. with the rhetorics, but it's still quite an interesting sign. I had the pleasure of uh, listening to President Trump uh, some 10 days ago in Davos and uh, exactly a year earlier to Xi Jinping. And if you compare those speeches, as many people have done, and you've probably seen this, but quite remarkable how Xi Jinping came to Davos with a long, comprehensive speech, which is China speaks to the world. Here's our message 
to the world. Here's our message. We need capitalism is necessary. Free trade is necessary. We need the rules. We need the rules-based order. Climate change is for real. We need to live up to our Paris commitments. We will spend money and resources on that. Uh, no mention, of course, of human rights and rule of law, but all the other stuff. Uh, and quite eloquently, in a rather beautiful uh, speech in, in many ways, and, and uh, uh, interestingly, this speech was delivered uh, only days before the inauguration of uh, President Trump. Um, uh, and, and you may question the sincerity of this, and of course there are questions about intellectual property rights and so on, and uh, you know, in the international trade systems, which are very real, but the rhetoric is that China has a role in the world. Now compare that to Donald Trump's speech, which was not a bad speech, particularly not for <laughs> current standards. Uh, 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 <laughs> that the main message was uh, America first does not mean America alone. We're not against the free trade. Well, he didn't say free trade. We're not against trade deals, understood bilateral and all the trade deals, but they have to be fair, meaning fair to America. And, uh, and there was very scant mention uh, of any project that was bigger than uh, the transactional interests of the US in the world. This is a strong message. And it's quite interesting to, to, to see the contrast between that and any, uh, you know, in, very different between the, uh, all the precedents we've had until recently, but that is something quite interesting to reflect about. Um, so the question is, is there, is there still an idea of the West that has sufficient power to concentrate the mind in such a way that it spurs real action? because there will be enough of it for speeches and for, you know, for summits, but does it convert into real action and real money and real investments and so on? I hope so, of course. I, I, I think that I think so, but I'm not sure. So there's a real, there's a real question here. And here we come to Asle's uh, good points about Europe. Uh, uh, just to take the topical issue of, of last, uh, last uh, or, or, or the, the Davos meeting, we had Merkel and Macron. Uh, speaking. Merkel, uh, solid, relatively predictable, no surprises, uh, a lot about digitalization and, and so on, but also a solid defense of Europe, of course, as you would expect. And then Macron with a sort of a youthful energy who had, uh, I think, the longest speech of any leader uh, that basically <laughs> said, um, I will first reform everything in France, which will not take too much time. I will then, <laughs> uh, with Merkel, uh, lift Europe to new heights. And uh, very pointedly, he uh, deliberately said, those of us who want to go ahead have to go ahead. We can't wait for the rest. It's in everybody's interest that we lead ahead. And when Europe was done, he also had uh, several ideas for the world. So, that was, <laughs> so um, now, um, coming out of that, I was asked by BBC what I thought about the speech, and the first thing I came to say, uh, uh, which, I, reflecting on it, wasn't such a bad idea, was to say, I think Macron's energy combined with Merkel's experience uh, might lead to something. So I think, and I, here I associate myself, I would just add France to, um, yes, Germany is number one, France is a good number two, and, and the future of Europe as... Uh, you know, as uh, Europe as more than just a couple of countries, but, but a concept of somebody who tries to keep investing in a global order with some global rules is important. Now, what does the world look like? Well, back then in the heyday of the uh, Berlin Wall, where I started, um, 60s, 70s. Five minutes, please. Uh, yeah, uh, 60s, 70s, the, um, uh, the, the, the combined GDP of this West was above 60% of global GDP. That was the, the brunt of it, right? Today, we're, it's, it's going down. It's, 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 it's going towards 40, 40. That's still a lot, but it's not half, right? So more than half of global GDP is not in what we used to refer to as the West. That's the growth of China, it's India, a lot of other Asian countries, plus plus, right? So, so it's a more, so the, the OECD uh, share of global economy has gone down. That's interesting. I mean, that's something we have to reflect upon. What does that mean <coughs> for institutions and institution building? What does that mean for, for uh, partnerships um, out there? Um, in this globalization wave, which was at its highest after the Berlin Wall fell, first I have to say globalization as we saw it then is to a certain degree in retreat. So uh, the trade as a share of... Uh, GDP is going down somewhat. FDI, foreign divest, uh, direct investment, is going down as share of global. Not that the volume is down, but the share 
of global GDP is going down. So globalization as a perfectly universal thing is not as much in fashion. We now see more regional developments. We see internationalization in clusters. And actually technology may help because with, uh, with new means of production, fourth industrial revolution and so on, maybe the need to build something on one side of the planet, to ship it around the planet will go down. That's, not that's good for the climate actually, but it, but, but it means that the globalization as we knew it is not necessarily there any longer. Mm -hmm. Second consequence of globalization was, very positively, that the difference between rich and poor countries narrowed. We still have rich and poor countries, mm -hmm. But many of the traditionally poor countries moved into, those who captured the idea, moved into middle income. Some of the previously rich countries had trouble, like Southern Europe and others. And that means that the discrepancy globally between countries is down. But in every single country on the planet, in, to different degrees, this, this, um, inequalities rise on the inside. Mm. And that happens to an extreme degree in the US, which is... I mean, it's a long story, but I think it's part of the reason why recent developments went in the way. A lot of people felt they were lost out on the way to the promised land, and the old dream, the old sense of a big we that we were all part of has gone. We see some of those trends in, trends in Europe, not as extreme in economic terms yet, but the perception that I lost the train, somebody took the train, I, I, somebody came to the station and the train left, I wasn't there, is a challenge. I this feeds back to the idea of the West, mm. because the West as its best was not only defined by its adversary, but also by a common shared belief, which was shared by Christian Democrats, Social Democrats, Liberals, plus plus, every, you know, everybody but the fringes, that there is something about free, open society, tolerance, democracy, uh, combined with an economic model, combined with a trade model, that brings us together, and I don't know. And I think I'm mentioning this, I know my minutes are soon gone, but I mentioned this in the security conference because there is absolutely no, and I say as a former defense minister, a tank is just a tank. It's better to have a tank than not to have a tank, but the tank doesn't give purpose in itself. You need to have some kind of political underpinning, something yep. shared yep. that makes it useful to ally with other people with tanks and airplanes and, and cyber defenses if it's going to be meaningful. So that must be part of this discussion. Mm. And, 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 and I, 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 I repeat one thing I said, I think, last year, which just struck me as super important to understand. Security conferences, whether they are at Leoncoln or Munich or anywhere else, used to talk about trouble out there. Today they focus on what is it with us, and that is an important discussion. I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Espen. Thank you very much indeed.